Hello, everyone. Happy Labor Day weekend. Can you believe it's here already? It's flown. <laughs> <laughs> Another flying by summer, but lots of great gardening this summer, and we've got a whole new season ahead of us. So we're kind of in the transition right now, coming from the late summer into the early fall. Uh, lots of things coming into the nursery, the mums, the pansies, all the wonderful fall magic, and lots going on at Maryfield Garden Center. So we've got uh, lots going on today as well. Today we're going to, first of all, fall is a perfect time to plant. Just a perfect time to plant. But what do you plant? That's what's kind of, you know, how do you figure that out? Well, you should plant what you love. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. Yes, planting what you love. Mm -hmm. Actually, you're furnishing your outdoor rooms. Mm -hmm. Just, and you need to give it as much attention as you would furnishing your living room because it, it, it is your space and you pay taxes on it. It is my favorite statement that I borrowed from Andre <laughs> Viet. And um, why not utilize that space? There are so many plants to choose from. And, and I have this fun little uh, picture that we'll bring up, which I always use for this kind of a situation because it says, Wow, what shall I choose? <laughs> you know? oh, and that is precisely what we're going to talk about today. Last week, we actually uh, showed a part of my own garden simply because there are so many established plants there. I've been at this for a long time. And it, there's a definite advantage to showing plants that are established in the garden because if you select carefully, you won't have high maintenance and keeping things trimmed or having to replace them because there's a plant out there for every place. It just takes a little research and we're essentially going to do just a little research today. That's great. What are a few of those plants? What are some of those choices? And there are lots of choices out lots there, choices. I tell you. So, Before we get started, a couple of quick announcements. First of all, I want to thank Diane for taking over for me last weekend. She did a great job as always. She thank you, did. Diane. Uh, so, and had a little fun with my daughter out fishing at a fishing tournament. Right. So that was fun. Uh, so a couple of quick announcements. First of all, Monday's Labor Day. We're going to close a little bit early at Maryfield Garden Center that day going to be open from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. so we can go and enjoy our Labor Day picnics and, and that type thing. Um, so we've and then we've got something coming up very exciting next weekend. Our seminars begin. Uh, if you if you're on our mailing list hopefully you got your seminar schedule uh, in the mail. I got mine yesterday. So they are, they are out there and ready to roll. It is filled with the great topics that we have coming up this uh, starting next Saturday. And we're going to start with three great ones, as always, on, uh, at our Maryfield location, Fabulous Fall Container Gardens. Karen Rexroad is going to be talking about that at the Maryfield Community Hall next door to our Maryfield location. Uh, at Fair Oaks, Amy Strunk and Tina Saucedo who are going to be talking about how to create fresh flower bouquets. Now they're kind of our wedding gurus at the uh, Fair Oaks location. They're doing a lot of weddings with fresh flowers. And David next week will be at uh, our Gainesville location talking about um, lawn alternatives. Now of course David is our one of our great lawn, lawn specialists, but <laughs> he's going to be talking about lawn alternatives. So well, there's something out there for everybody. The that's right. That's right. <laughs> In so. small spaces. <laughs> exactly. <Okay>. Exactly. <laughs> but again, if you if you haven't p gotten your seminar schedule yet, come by the stores. Uh, you can go online to MaryfieldGardenCenter.com. If you're on our email mailing list, I know an e-blast went out yesterday with a link to it, and I believe there'll be one going out next week as well. So. Take advantage. These are going to be great. They'll go all the way up through the end of October, and then we'll take a little break, and then we'll have the holiday classes. So free seminars are, are just wonderful, wonderful ways to learn more about gardening. Really, and we have expanded those so greatly, and so many wonderful people. It is an opportunity to do some of the research that I'm going to talk to you about today. But let's, let's go quickly through just a few of these slides, because there's something that I do want to share with you. When we have the opportunity, various groups go out to nurseries. We don't just pick up a pamphlet and order from it or go online and order from uh, things. 
we actually go to nurseries and test the quality, tag plants frequently. This is a display garden. It's wonderful to see what plants really look like when they're planted with one another. To see the changes of color and the changes of texture and the changes of shapes. This is actually one of the nurseries that a group of our um, gentlemen visited mm -hmm. last week. And um, what an incredible thing it is, you know, just there's there's so many shapes and so many sizes and we buy a tremendous number of plants from this particular nursery. Mm -hmm. Some of the cuttings that I actually have here on the table came from this nursery because they are unique, absolutely unique and need again research. How many different nurseries have they been to this year? I believe that Mike, Michael Fay, uh -huh. was the one who said he had counted up and they had actually been to 80 nurseries wow. mm -hmm. and had chosen uh, plants, frequently tagged the plants mm -hmm. for this season, but for next season also. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's just not potluck. Right. You know, I talked to Michael yesterday out did you? in Oregon okay. and he said that they had been to, already that morning, it was like 8 o'clock, they'd been to three nurseries already that morning. Right. So. Well, it was 8 o'clock here. No, I no, think he was talking about 8 o'clock there. Oh, really? <laughs> they Whoa. were up early and, and <laughs> going <it>. through. Okay. <laughs> uh, I want to share with you um, a couple of places that I actually went last mm -hmm. week. I don't have the opportunity to get out as much as I used to, but I do enjoy it when I do. And, and usually come away with, guess what, some pictures. This is, is at a friend, Sandy McDougall, who has gardened in this garden for many years, like myself the opportunity for someone who loves plants to show those plants as they have matured and look at the changes of textures that she has here in this garden. S look to see that beyond that screening you cannot see the nursery and she planted it for that reason. But a screening area is so important because it shades us from road noise uh, light, uh, privacy, you name it. And a blend of plants is wonderful. Let's take one a quick look at a sunny part of our garden. Wonderful there. Lots of blends of textures and colors. And then in the back, almost total shade. And, and I would like you to see that picture because last week we talked about ground covers. And David next week is going to be talking about uh, lawn alternatives mm -hmm. where you're looking at some of them right, right here <laughs> you know it's stepping stones it's a lot of stone it's creeping time mm -hmm. if it's in sunshine it's uh, Lysomachia nimularia or whatever right. <laughs> you know, so he's going to be coming up with some of those wonderful ground cover things too they're for sun they're for shade mm -hmm. and often they're mixed with beautiful stones because while some of these things are, uh, you might tread on them somewhat, mm -hmm. you can't walk on them all the time. That's true. You know, That's it's true. just not meant for okay. that. <laughs> all right, we're going to take a quick break and come back with some plants that you will love. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Maryfield's Gardening Advisor. We're talking about beautiful plants, plants that you love, plant choices today. So Peggy's out in our virtual garden and she's got some great ideas for you. <laughs> Welcome to the garden. All right, last week we talked about small plants, miniature garden, gardens that could be tabletop gardens for those who can no longer get down on their knees. And a lot of people enjoy gardening for all their life. It's very stimulating. It's, it's a wonderful thing. I've certainly enjoyed it, and I think it's, uh, it's something that I've shared with family and friends and all of you out there, too. So we talked about the in-ground plantings as well as the container garden plantings within this garden. I've chosen to come back to that garden because it has a sense of enclosure. People need enclosure for privacy purposes, for noise, for light, uh, or just that feeling of security that it gives to you. 
If it's a small garden, you want to choose plants that are not going to hugely overgrow that space. You, want, you don't want to plant a Leyland cypress. It gets huge, and it's amazing how fast it can happen. So let's talk about some of those plants that can be understory plants because I have large oak trees and maybe you do, maybe you don't. This type of plant can give you shade and so forth. So what is in this area? You can see in the background that I do have a lot of large oak. Fortunately they're oak because you can garden easily beneath those. There are a lot of Japanese maple. There's repetition here among the diversity. I have an upright maple. I have a cascading maple. G gives you that wonderful color that only a maple can do, okay? Then I've got Hinoki cypress and a lot of repetition of that. And then the blue spruce. So look at the changes of colors. But there is enough green within this to make all of that work. Let's look deeper into the garden and see what else is helping with this enclosure. As you enter in this garden, which is just off the driveway and just off the road, here again is that cascading maple. Usually I get literally down under and selectively prune out to open up this maple. It didn't happen this year, but that's all right. It's a little moppy, but I, I like to see the structure and I can't do that right now. Okay, but it's still beautiful. Then with this cascade, there is another maple back in this area that's sort of a feature within this garden. But look at this beautiful plant. It's evergreen, so it plays a wonderful part in the winter time. It is Cryptum, it's, no, it's of the Hanoki family, okay, Camisiparis. Cripsy, it's beautiful, gold-tipped. Not heavy gold, but gold-tipped. The gold is picked up by a golden Japanese maple. And then you get, even in the background, more of the maple. So you've got deciduous plants that lose their leaves, and you've also got evergreens. Let's look at some of the other plants that are within here, okay? This, now this is the background. So I plant for year-round interest, and that's not too hard to do if you give it a little time and study. There are beautiful dogwood that are wonderful understory plants, particularly, or at the edge of the uh, larger trees are out all by themselves. There are a lot of azaleas. There's the evergreen uh, Otto Lucan's laurel. These things give you more than one season of interest. They give you solid green from the laurels and the Hinoki cypress and so forth. They give you spring color, and then they give you the fall. You, you get the dogwood turning in the fall. Let's continue with some of this. You can peek into this garden. It's not solid. This, this uh, Japanese maple gives you a lot of enclosure, but still you can be intrigued by wanting to go within and see what's in there. There's upright boxwood. I love those because they make a definite statement. And there's a contrast between that upright feeling and the rounded feeling that you see here of two of the lower growing boxwood. And there are so many boxwood to choose from. But there's a nice contrast there. Again, you see a lot of other evergreens within this. Let's, let's go with these. Okay, because I've got a lot to share. I always do. All right, back into this. What are some of the things that add that interest as we go along? Because it's wonderful to face off some of these and underplant some of these. That's what gives you a lot of the seasonal interest. Exbury azaleas. Not planted enough, really. They love the understory environment, so they're good in part shade nice brilliant orange and then it quietly goes back to being part of the supporting cast. Here's your boxwood. Contrast of color with grasses, ornamental grasses, hanoki, uh, hakanakloa, okay? Let's go through a couple more of these. All right, this is what I talked to you about last week. Evergreens. 
there is a size for everybody. You've got the miniature Hinoki's. You've got the mid-size Hinoki's that may grow to only two or three feet and then five feet and 25 feet. So those are your choices. Let's go through a couple more. Here is a difference, okay? Different sizes. Little ones can be kept small, but don't buy the great big one for a little space because there's there's the right choice for you. And the next one. Here again, you can see the small, the miniature, picking up the color of the large um, Cripsy back here. And the next one, please. Is there one more? Now, ah, this is a Mahonia. Beautiful, beautiful plant for shade. You need to consider how much sun, how much shade when you're selecting these plants. This one will tolerate quite a bit and it's wonderful interest. But look at the texture of that one. And then the next picture. Add containers for the color within this garden. Here I've chosen a, a, a mass of caladiums and everybody needs a place to sit down and smell the roses, even if they're in a rose. We'll be back with you in just a moment and show you more choices. Welcome back to Maryfield's Gardening Advisor. We're pleased to have you with us today. And we're talking about plant the plants that you love. And we're trying to introduce you to some of those that I love and some alternatives to some of those. We were looking inside this enclosed garden and the fact that many of us need those plants to give us that feeling of enclosure. And what can they be? So we've stepped outside of that enclosure to look back at some of those plants. Wonderful plant that's over in this area that can be trimmed back or it, it will grow, I think, eventually to probably 10 feet, but I never let it get that tall. And a, a trim a year keeps it down. It's a, it's a false yew, Cephalotaxis. And the wonderful thing about this is the deer don't currently eat it, okay? So if you can't grow you, because deer love you and I love you, Y-E-W also, this is the plant for you, false you, Cephalotaxis. There is here, which you can't see easily, okay, another wonderful plant that so far the deer haven't bothered. It's a type of euonymus. It grows again in somewhat of an upright situation and with just one minor trimming stays very much within bounds. You can see the taller growing um, Hadoki cypress because they come from little miniatures in between to 25 feet. Okay, depends upon what you need in your garden. And then you can see also the, the Japanese maple. Now, Every garden, if there's room, needs a space for a little bit of color. I have a lot of perennials growing here. And right now, because this was taken last week, I have Perovskia in bloom. It's a wonderful, almost a shrubby type plant. Gives you a long period of bloom. And right now is a perfect time to make the selection of some of these plants because they're in bloom at the garden center. It's easy to choose then. And a lot of other types of perennials. Boxwood here on this other side too. Let's, let's roll through some of these fairly quickly. Here's your boxwood. I absolutely love boxwood. Many new varieties to choose from absolutely gorgeous. And here is another underused and interesting plant that a lot of new varieties have come out recently. And that is Abelia. Beautiful foliage color, but also interesting flowers that flower off and on throughout the entire summer. And, and are interesting even in winter. Look at this. You can hardly see the flowers. They're small, but they're beautiful. But the color of the plant itself is very exciting. And the next one, please. A little bit closer view of that 
false you, the cephalotaxis. And look how a lot of these things that are so beautifully green are good background plants. They make everything in front of it show better. Look, look at this canna, which I don't really always grow for the flowers, but they are very interesting. But look how well it plays because it's got a solid green background. And of course, the hibiscus, the hardy hibiscus. Couldn't be without it up close. The beautiful color of, of the foliage of this picks up the color of the annual Penicetum rubrum and plays against the canna leaf. And here's a touch of the blue perovskia that's coming into the side. I kind of like that combination. The next one, please. Back from this a little bit with more shade is Pieris japonica. Many varieties of that also. There's a dwarf reform, one that'll get five to six feet. Incredible interest throughout all of the seasons. It has beautiful new color in the foliage. It has blooms. When the blooms are finished, the dried blossom of seed heads are interesting. And of course, it's evergreen. And beside that is the Joe Pie weed, which the butterflies flock to. And there's been, have you noticed? There's been so many beautiful butterflies this year. It's been so enjoyable. And the next one. You need players in the garden that complement all of these wonderful evergreens and, and uh, the structure in your garden. You need some color. This is one of the most effective perennials that you can plant for a long period of bloom. That is the hardy geranium. This happens to be one called Roseanne. The next one, please. Soon, not until October, late October, you have that incredible fall color in the foliage. And think about those things when you're making your choices for the plants that you love. I've cleared out, this was obviously in the past, cleared out, cut back some of those perennials, planted in a lot of bulbs because that becomes the major player for the color against all this evergreen that you see in the background in the springtime. And then the perennials come up around it. And so that's how you get all that ongoing color. Plant Amsonia hubrecta. It's great. You can see now this euonymus in, in here. I believe it's green spire. Euonymus, beautiful plant. The next one, please. Color, fall color from a crepe myrtle. Crepe myrtle is a year-round plant. Let's roll quickly through. I, how many are left, Deb? Two? Okay, here we go. Okay, I do want to talk to you just quickly about boxwood. This shows you one that I pruned in the spring. It's too late to prune right now, so hold back with your pruners for the moment. If you prune right now on some of these boxwood, it may shoot up some growth that'll be killed in the winter, and it's not attractive. So. If you didn't prune before the middle of July, hold off until it's colder, okay? And, and don't do it right now. So this one has not been pruned, this one has been pruned. That I go into these boxwood and make cuttings in the winter time for Christmas and that sort of thing, and that's the healthy time to open up these plants. Okay, here is one of those upright boxwood, again, with a beautiful feature in the garden. There, it takes all kinds of things to make a garden. A garden is never finished, and it is incredibly therapeutic. I hope you've enjoyed these. We'll be back with you in a moment. And by the way, we will be taking phone calls today. Hi everybody, welcome back. 
Uh, as Peggy mentioned when she was in our virtual garden, we will be taking phone calls in our next segment. So we haven't done that in a couple of weeks. So we're, I hope you've been <laughs> saving your questions up and we're excited to hear from you. So before we get to that though, we've got more information. Well, we're talking about plants you love. We always have more information. Absolutely. <laughs> well, isn't that a good thing? That's right. <laughs> talking about plants you love, and I've, I've made uh, cuttings of, of most of those. The, the colors, the textures are wonderful. Absolutely whole, wonderful. Uh, and, and one of the nice things about diversity in plants is number one you don't have as much trouble with insects because it just seems like when you've got a large group of something that insect comes along and says we I've got a free meal right. a lot of free meals you know <laughs> <laughs> so diversity helps in mm -hmm. those respects and if you have a row of beautiful arborvita and sometimes that's what you need okay um, and one dies, where do you go from there, right. you know? Uh, it's uh, a little difficult sometimes and to look find a little one strange. that's established, <laughs> you know, to, to replace it. So for that reason, I like the diversity. Right. Of course, I like the plants too, okay? So we're only showing a few of them, and, and we will roll through just a, a few of the others. I've, I've thrown in some possible alternatives to some of those that I showed you, because this is your landscape. While I may be showing you what I have done, that is my landscape. And you need to put your own stamp mm -hmm. on your own landscape. Hopefully, by showing you an established garden, particularly one that's a lot of shade, um, you can make your choices from those for what works in your own garden. This happens to be Ilex verticillata, which is a winterberry holly. It is a deciduous holly. It just is part of the team most of the summer. Mm -hmm. Doesn't have outstanding foliage, but comes into its own in the fall because this is what you get. Just spectacular. It Look is that. spectacular. Mm -hmm. It really is. And of course, it's wonderful for cutting. And, and the next picture will show you actually out at our Fair Oaks location in the display garden in the front there a grouping of those that have been limbed up and under planted with a ground cover. This is a, also a wonderful way to to get some hedging and to get some privacy uh, and still not feel totally enclosed. And to see the structure of plants is always very interesting. The following uh, few pictures are of a plant that I just couldn't be without, and that is crepe myrtle. There's so many different sizes, from miniature to this one that happens to be very, very tall. So many seasons of interest in this one, Debbie. Mm -hmm. it, it's absolutely a spectacular plant. Love, so you've got love, 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 crepe myrtle. Got that really mm -hmm. tall one, and as we proceed through these, you'll see some of the other advantages. For those larger ones, the structure of that tree is so, so important. Limbing it up, removing some of those lower limbs, being able to see that beautiful bark, and as it matures, it, it's particularly outstanding. Here again is a tree that is wonderful to plant in groupings and then plant small shrubs and ground covers to complement it. The following picture is actually a group of small crepe myrtle. They come in all sizes. Blooms for a long period of time. This one's only three to four feet and planted in groupings, which is fantastic. So the crepe myrtles are wonderful choices with so many. Uh, there's some, I have some now in my garden that have been in for several years that are only eight feet tall. And they're a part of my borders right. and, and a wonderful part of it, you know. The next plant is also uh, a wonderful contributor to a border, to a hedge, or as a feature in your garden, and that is the hydrangea. Um, there's many, many different types of hydrangea with different periods of bloom. Complementing any border in the next picture is magnolia. Magnolia 
can be huge like the southern magnolia or it can be small like this incredible little one that we have here and when I went out into the garden if we can come back to um, the uh, desk for just a moment let me show you the difference of these look at the change of the leaf structure mm -hmm. in this these are both small growing magnolias both of which are usually in the 10 to 12 foot range which is small for a magnolia absolutely beautiful foliage and the blossom is is similar to the the, the big one right the grand flora mm -hmm. the southern magnolia the fragrance is incredible and boy is it wonderful for christmas greens oh yes oh, it's just great yes love that is. there's always new varieties and changes coming down the pike we always have a huge selection of the next picture in the fall and that is camellias. Mm -hmm. Thanks to a gentleman who passed away recently from the Arboretum, a lot of wonderful, wonderful new plants come from our Arboretums. And the camellia happens to be one of those because it, now we have those that are incredibly hardy in this area. So choose camellia. Again, the foliage is incredibly beautiful. The following picture is in lieu of perhaps the Japanese maple or in addition to. There are red bud that are so exciting. Look at the colors of the foliage in the red buds. And in addition to that, they bloom before this foliage comes out. There's cascading, there's, ah, the world has opened up with these. And if you are really into the natives, the following picture will, I'm sure, turn you on to one of the, one of the best natives that we've got. And, and uh, this one is really filled with bloom. It happens to be, again, at the Fair Oaks location. It's fringe, fringe tree, tree. Kianothus. Right. I have it as an understory tree in my garden because it's native there. Mm -hmm. It grew there, I didn't plant it. It never blooms this sparsely. I mean this heavily, this <laughs> one is sparse. The fragrance is incredible. Oh, wonderful. When I was a little girl growing up, we called it Grandpa's Graybeard because the, the fringes of the mm -hmm. flowers were so <laughs> interesting. So, I've just shown you a few of the plants that I love. And hopefully you will love them Maybe too. Maybe you will, That's but right. if you don't, you'll find something that you There's another one out there for you. That's right. Absolutely. Well, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to open up the phone line. 703-387-1046 is our number here. So give us a call if you've got a question. Want to say hi? We'll talk to you in just a couple of minutes. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. It's time for phone calls, 703-387-1046. If you have any questions for us, and Peggy, we do have a caller on the line. It is Carolyn, who's calling from Waldorf. Are you there, Carolyn? Yes, I am. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine. Enjoying the show. Thank you. What can we do for you today? Well, um, I have a question about fall webworms and spider mites that are seeming to attack all of my beautiful oh, no. plants. Oh, dear. That's not good. <laughs> no. <laughs> Help. Help. <laughs> okay. With the webworms, number one, I'm not going to tell you a specific uh, chemical or non-chemical, for that matter, to use on the plants. I'll, I'll let you make a phone call to the information center to get the latest kind of thing, okay? okay. I'm always teasingly saying, I'll let David take care of the beast. I'm going to take care of the beauty, okay? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but web worms, yes. Um, it's not terrible if they're up so high that you can't reach them. But if they are where you can, there's, there's several things that you can do. Number one, they're enclosed in a netting kind of thing. That's their protection from the birds because the birds love these uh, worms. And so you can open it up uh, with a broomstick if it's hard to reach. I've done that myself, right. you know. Uh -huh. And there's certain things that they really love. I know they always love the cherry trees and, and some of that kind of thing. There's also... Um, 
a wonderful bacillus thuringiensis, I can't think of the current brand name, right. okay, that is organic, that if you get inside that web, you can spray with, and it only affects caterpillars, okay? Okay. And of course, there are other things that can be can be used, but please make a phone call. I've got webworms, you know, if it's organic and you want to stick with that, what do I use? If not, I'll stick with that, okay? Now, the other question was... Um, the spider mites. The spider mites, okay. And is this on azaleas by any chance, or uh, Pieris japonica? What What are the spider mites um, on? On a spruce. I have a like, globe spruce. Uh-oh, uh-oh. And, and that really should be taken care of also. So when you're asking, ask them for the latest thing to use on that particular thing. Many times, because I I'm, I'm try to be as organic as I possibly can, I use a very heavy blast from the hose to wash down a lot of these plants, mm -hmm. okay. and, and it will help. But spider mites are kind of hanging in there, okay? Right. So give a call to the information counter. They're wonderful. And Carolyn, you can call any of the three locations, or, yes. or better yet, if you're out our way, you know, bring a sample Not by. Uh, yes. We're always there to help. Okay. To be sure that it is spider mite, yes. Right. Okay. Thanks so much for calling. Thank you. Have a Thank great you. weekend. You too. You too. Thanks. Bye -bye. Okay, let's see. Our next caller is Annette, who's calling from Manassas. Hi, Annette. Good morning. Good morning. Very nice to see you, ladies, this morning. Thank you. <laughs> um, I was wondering uh, if you have ever used Lorapetalum in your landscape and what your opinion is on it. Lorapetalum is absolutely beautiful. I don't have it in my in my garden for a lot of reasons. Uh, one thing is, uh, at this point in the game, there's some space for a whole lot of new things, you know. Uh -huh. And and perhaps that's one reason that I have not done it. I think it's an absolutely beautiful plant. Uh, hardiness, it seems to be doing well in this area. I have not been around it that much to know is it really going to hang in there in a severe winter, but there are several of our um, horticulturists, uh, particularly at Fair Oaks, that absolutely love it and think it's doing beautifully hardness-wise here. I think it's a lovely plant, beautiful is it, foliage. Uh, is it easy to maintain? I think so. Okay. I don't think there's a problem with maintenance. I think it's a beautiful color. I think it's a nice contrast of texture. And, and and putting it particularly, you know, we have microclimates in our garden. Yes. And if something is a little questionable hardiness-wise, that's where you want to go with it, you know. Now, it does need some sunshine to maintain that color well, so give it a try and okay. report back. Okay. Thank you, ladies, very much. <laughs> Thank great you. Day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, let's see if we can squeeze Joyce from Alexandria in. You there, you there Joyce? Joyce, yeah. you, hi, how yeah. are you? I'm fine, how are you? Good, you have a Good quick morning. question? Yes, I do have a question. Mm -hmm. I have two problems, and I think one of the problems is causing the other problem. Uh, I, have, I am an organic gardener, and unfortunately, I have a tremendous problem with mosquitoes, so that we can't use the garden, oh. um, and that's very frustrating as I watch you walk through yours. <laughs> um, the other problem, which is the bigger issue, uh, believe it or not, is bamboo. I uh -oh. have bamboo growing where other established mature trees and shrubs are. I'd like to get rid of the bamboo, which I think will help with the mosquito. That's my problem. What do I do with this bamboo? How do well, I get rid of it? Well, let's go back to the mosquito issue. That's the easiest. Um, no, it's not. Not really. They're both difficult issues. But I too have mosquitoes and I am a mosquito magnet. There is just no doubt about it. I have gone to some essential oils that my uh, daughter Michelle has gotten into to use on my skin because I, I don't want to put DEET on my skin. And it's working for me, as long as I apply it when I go out. It is unfortunate that if I'm out there gardening for any extended period of time, I wear the long jeans or and, and socks to, to help protect me. But I have found that these essential oils um, are working. And uh, it, it's wonderful because the has not been in the picture for me at all this year. 
The other thing that I do is use a lot of um, mosquito bits. Any standing water anywhere gets mosquito bits because that really cuts down on the population. As far as the bamboo is concerned, I think that we <laughs> need to go to a break at the moment and really it, it's going to take a little while, but cutting it all down, getting it out of there and repeatedly cutting it until you literally starve it to death is about the only way to do it. Now don't blaspheme every bamboo. There are some magnificent clump bamboos, usually much smaller probably than the one you're talking about, that are absolutely beautiful in the landscape. But I do know that bamboo is hard to deal with. I hope you don't have a whole lot of it. And uh, as I see, cutting it down and um, continuing to cut it as those new shoots come up is one way to Good luck, Joyce. <laughs> Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, -bye. Bye -bye. we're going to take a quick break and come right back. See you soon. This hour just flies by, so we've got a little bit of time left. We, our next caller is Brenda, who's calling from Williamsport. Hi, Brenda. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. How are Good you? Good morning. What can we do for you today? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. It, my question is, I actually planted a tree. My husband, of course, helped me. It's called a tulip tree. Mm -hmm. And what happened is uh, we planted it six years ago in memory of my mother. And it's never bloomed. Aww. It's about 18 feet tall right now. Wow, <laughs> and it should I have. <laughs> it should have. But I know, that's what I'm thinking. I mean, it is getting, it's starting to turn right now, but there is no tulips. And when I was in Connecticut uh, visiting our children, our son, I noticed these big, beautiful trees, and I really researched it and found out it was called a tulip tree. So okay, I, I, I have to be sure of what, what you're, you're calling it to. This is the the one that blooms in the springtime? I'm, yes, ma'am, I'm assuming okay. it does bloom, okay. and it's never bloomed. Okay, okay. There, are, there are a lot of different ones out there, and, and they're usually pretty easy to bloom. They don't normally have to atta attain a certain age, and certainly yours has or should have, by the size and the amount of time that it's been in the ground. Assuming that it gets some sunshine, this isn't planted in a whole lot of shade, is it? Oh, no, it's in, in pure in, open sunshine. In open sun, then it yes, jolly well have. should have bloomed by now, you know. That's what I'm thinking. Um, um, now, yeah. often the blossoms can be bitten early on, and therefore they wouldn't bloom, but you would see those buds, and usually they have a chance to open up somewhat before a late frost can at times get them and turn them all dark, but you would have seen that. I don't have a good answer for you as to why this has not bloomed, okay? You just have to come down and bring, give it, bring a sample and pay us a visit. <laughs> and give it another chance because the structure of that tree is beautiful anyway. Oh, it's so gorgeous. If, you know, if it doesn't bloom uh, next year or the following year, just say, ooh, you're beautiful anyway. Oh, I, I think the same thing, and it's there for because a reason. Because the structure is right. absolutely right. beautiful. Yeah. And then the winter it's time, very gorgeous. it's very yeah. pretty. So just say, you don't have to bloom. You're beautiful anyway. <laughs> there you go. Okay, I didn't know if it needed a sister a tree, a brother tree, or something. No, it shouldn't. It, yeah. it shouldn't. It shouldn't. Brenda, thank you so much thank for the Thank you call. so much for Take helping care. me a little bit. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay, let's see. Bit. James is calling from Manassas. Hi, James. Good morning. Good, Good morning. morning to you. We're running really short on time. Do you have a quick question? A quick question. Mm -hmm. I have a holly tree that was transplanted um, late in the spring. Uh, four other trees were transplanted with it, and the one tree looked like it was going to die. All the leaves turned black and they fell off, and I thought, oh, gee, I'll have to replace it. But a couple weeks later, new growth started reappearing at the tips of the branches and it has uh, nice new leaves at the tips of the branches but none of the leaves along the branch came back and i'm wondering if this growth is going to come back will it fill in or should i be doing something to encourage the uh, growth along the branches to fill back in so the tree matches with the others just let it grow okay 
Fortunately, hollies are pretty resilient and uh, it may take a little bit of time or it may surprise you and come quickly next spring. But don't be alarmed if it is next spring oh, okay. until you begin to get growth inside. But I believe you will, James. And, and I'm confident of that because I had a large oak fall on half of my wonderful native holly. And uh, it, it was big, okay, so it's taken it a couple of years, but it's back and it's beautiful, so hang in there, James. Well, that's encouraging. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for calling. Yes, ma'am. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Have a great weekend. Okay, we, uh, Don is calling from Solomons. Are you there, Don? Yes, I'm on. Okay, we have okay. less than a minute. Well, you have a very fast question? Yeah, my question is, I have dogwood trees and I would like to trim back the branches a little bit. And how far can I trim back? Now that's one that I can answer in one minute. Oh. But okay. yes, you can. <laughs> you can trim back a dogwood, okay? And, and I don't have a problem with that. You're not going to stimulate any growth from that right now. But uh, don't take advice given within one minute as to how to go about that, all right? Good. We'll be happy to have you, again, call and uh, talk to someone Great. at the information counter, okay? Thanks yes, so much. You can do that. All right. Okay. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you. Okay, we've got to go. I hope you enjoyed the show, and I hope we'll see you next week when we're going to talk about life of the party plants.